Coming up in this video, I convert a 3800 engine over to E85 fuel, including installing an air to fuel ratio gauge, installing an O2 sensor in the exhaust system, fuel rail setups, all hoses, adjusting the tune, and installing and hot wiring a new fuel pump. Please thumbs up, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and if you got any questions, I'll answer them in the comments. why you might want to convert to E85 is because you can get up to about 5% more power out of your engine and the fuel is pretty cheap. Because E85 cools so much, you can also push your engine harder and run more boost overall and you can adjust your timing later. This will result in probably even more power. E85 has an octane rating of around 105. It's a very stable fuel and will not damage your engine under a heavy load. Ethanol keeps your engine running cooler and it requires a larger volume of fuel in order to combust. It has some oxygen baked into it as well, allowing you to make more power. A lot of modern cars have a system called flex fuel where it will allow you to run E85 anyways. If your car was made before the mid 2000s, it is very likely not flex fuel. 3800 engines are not flex fuel, so we're going to have to do a few extra things to modify this in order to get it running. You'll need a wideband oxygen sensor to tune afterwards. You might need higher flow fuel injectors, fuel rail setups. You'll have to replace all hoses for your fuel system that are not ethanol rated. You have to get a higher flow fuel pump. You may have to rewire the fuel pump in order to allow higher current. Adjusting the tune and maybe even a higher flow fuel filter. This video will cover every one of those aspects. See the description for sections on each one and also every part used in this video. So we're going to start with the air to fuel ratio gauge or the oxygen or O2 sensor. The computers on this engine is not capable of taking a fuel to air mixture feedback signal. So we are going to manually tune it ourselves with an external oxygen sensor. First, disconnect the battery because you're going to have the door open a lot. You can find this quick disconnect here in, in a link in the description. You're going to have to weld the bung in some place in your exhaust that comes with this thing. You must install the sensor pointed at least 10 degrees down into your exhaust stream at least 18 inches away from your exhaust port on the head and also up to 36 inches away if you're planning on having prolonged and sustained higher rpm you can buy this dual gauge pod that fits a 90 through 93 acura integra it just happens to be the same exact size as the fiero a pillar these holes are actually slightly too small so i'm going to have to grind them a little bit bigger i have the perfect wire wheel for this it happens to be right around two inches Express Paint still sells some of the matching interior colors. I bought all three of the gray colors for an 88 Fiero. I'm gonna test the colors of these to see which one matches the interior A-pillar trim panel. The 8247 is the winner. I'm priming this first and I'm going to put trim color on the outside. Always paint in a well-ventilated area. Shake the can well before painting. Hold the can about 12 to 18 inches away and start moving the can before you start spraying. Do two to three light coats and let them dry for a couple minutes in between each coat, but be sure to read the instructions of the can of paint that you buy. I don't really want this gauge sticking out, so I'm gonna rattle can this trim piece too. First, I'm gonna rough it up a little bit so the paint can stick with some 600 grit sandpaper. I used a wire wheel with a rubber band that fits just the perfect size. For some reason, this interior trim panel is already kind of hacked up. So I went to the junkyard and got a new one, but I'm gonna hack this one up even more by installing this AFR gauge. I've gotta feed these two connectors through. The biggest connector measures right in at 5 8 inches. If you take a tape measure and measure from this corner here to the center line, at about the six inch mark and the 15 inch mark are fasteners on the other side of this thing. So I'm going to try to drill right in between these two things. I think I'm gonna do about 12 and a half inches from the corner to get into a nice cavity. Stick it on here and mark it where it makes sense. So I'm going to grab a 5 8 inch hole saw. Then I'm gonna take a couple of zip ties, loop two of them and feed them through this hole in order to pull the cable. I'm gonna take a third zip tie and loop it around those first two and then pull the ends through this hole. Might help to use some needle nose pliers to wiggle it through finally. You could probably do this with this panel off the car, but I already had mine reattached. And make sure to pull plenty of extra through. You can feed this back behind this trim panel pretty easily. Just pull back this trim a little bit and start tucking it in. 
Go ahead and put the gauge in and make sure that it's oriented the right way so that it's level. And put the backing on with the two brass nuts. Go ahead and either put the lambda side or the air fuel ratio side into the gauge, then the seal, then the glass plate, and then the screw cover. I'm going to use air fuel ratio for mine because since I'm feeding the signal in through the EGR, I think it would be easier to handle an air fuel ratio instead of lambda and HP tuners. By default, this gauge is set up for air fuel ratio and not lambda. If you want to set it up for lambda, you would have to turn a potentiometer about a quarter quarter turn. I'm not planning on this being a permanent solution, so I want to make it removable. But once I'm done tuning this thing, I think I'll replace it with that junkyard panel. I'm going to add some dual lock Velcro on both sides so I can take it off and modify it as needed. I'm going to cut some of these Velcro strips to shape and then stick them on the inside of the gauge pod. Then I'm going to cut equal lengths and I'm going to barely stick them onto this Velcro, take off the backing, and then stick this whole thing where I want it to be. Then I'm going to remove the gauge pod and make sure that these things are stuck firmly. Then I'm going to install the gauge pod. First plug in the wiring and then attach to the Velcro to it. It might help to feed the wires back through on the other end, shorten them up so that they don't get pinched behind this thing. Take off the knee kicker plate underneath the steering wheel. This is just four 7mm screws. Before putting cable ends on, go ahead and make a cut in the insulation close to where the power and ground wires need to run to a different spot. Then pull them through the shielding. The sensor needs 12 volts supplied to it and a ground. And then it has a 5 volt output or a serial output. I'm going to attach the white output 5 volt cable to these pin and socket crimp connectors here. Then on the blue serial output, I'm going to put a socket only so that there's no bare wire present. I'm not going to use that one now. And then the black ground is going to go to this ring terminal, find a little screw to ground it through, and then the spade terminal for the red positive 12 volts, because that's going to go into my fuse panel. Be sure to install a 10 amp fuse in line with this. Always make sure to give these a good tug to make sure there's a solid connection. So now I'm going to take some stranded wire of equal or greater diameter, crimp an end onto it to extend over to my 5 volt EGR input, and then tuck it away. Otherwise, if you have the pro version of HP tuners, you could just run this signal voltage wire directly into the HP tuner module. Find a connector pin that goes into the EGR input. Or maybe you could take a fork connector and cut one of the forks off. I have a pin here, so I'm going to crimp this instead. The three tabs on this connector are for the wire and the two large ones are for the insulation. This is not a foolproof fitment because it doesn't have any retainment, but I cannot find the mating connector for this EGR cable. So I'm just going to wrap it up in electrical tape and call it a day. We're using the center pin on the EGR connector. Plug your battery back in and test it. When you leave the oxygen sensor unplugged from the circuit, the default output should be 2.35 volts. For this setup, I am using HP tuners because this is a GM engine. You will need some sort of tuning and monitoring software to be able to write a calibration to the engine controller. Mine is reading in 2.41 volts, so I need to apply an offset. I made a spreadsheet that makes the equation easy to enter in into HP tuners. Go to tools and math parameters. I've already made my function. I called it AFR from EGR transfer. I'm going to adjust the offset here based on the calculation from my spreadsheet. It should be this equation and then minus your offset. Mine happened to be 9.85. This will simply read the AFR ratio onto a gauge on HP tuners. In a later video, I will detail how to do a mass airflow sensor calibration tune. Here's the equation for that. And as you see here, I added a gauge in HP tuners to read that AFR number. Don't forget to plug it back in. Now it's time to modify my fuel rail system and replace all of the hoses. A diagram of all of the wiring and the fuel rails are on a forum post in the link in the description. Ethanol also reacts with aluminum, so choose your fuel system components wisely. First, shock the front wheels and then jack the back of the car up. You can use this jack point on the rear engine cradle and then put some jack stands under the jack points in front of the rear wheels. Go ahead and replace your fuel filter now with just a couple of 10 millimeter fasteners. In my original setup, I utilized the rubber hoses that existed in the OEM setup. Since we're going to this ethanol fuel, I'm instead going to replace these entire lengths of rubber hoses with the new push lock material that's ethanol rated. I'm going to get rid of all the steel tubing except for the steel tube going into the filter from the tank. You could get a high flow filter at the expense of not being able to filter as small of particles out. I don't think I'm going to need a higher flow filter to get the fuel rates that I need. I'm routing my fuel line so that they do not pass the belt. This is a requirement for the NHRA drag racing rules. Go ahead and install this 90 degree swivel fitting on the fuel filter first. Bends like these all cause a slight pressure drop in the line, so try to use as least as possible. Once you trim them to length, then route your fuel lines the way that you see fit, again not crossing over the belt. Then use a heat gun on this side in order to slip the barb side fitting in. Then I would P-clamp them to the firewall in some way. I used a hole that was already in here. 
Next, we're going to remove the gas tank so we can get to the pump. If I know I'm gonna take the gas tank out, I like to drive the car until it's about on empty. First, there's a cross brace with four 13 millimeter bolts. And then there are two 13 millimeter straps. You'll need a deep well 13 millimeter socket to get these nuts off. Go ahead and pull them the rest of the way off. There's also a connector you've got to take off that goes to the gas tank. At the rear of the tank towards the engine, there are five hose clamps that you'll have to take off. These pipes might be stuck. It might help to twist them and then wiggle them off. Sometimes I use a screwdriver to stick inside the hose and help pry off. And then start prying the tank out. Then slide the tank out from under the car. In case you decided to buy a new Rodney Dickman fuel tank, these are probably not ethanol compatible. I asked Rodney what he coated his tanks in, and his answer was zinc. If the interior of the tank is truly zinc, then this will react with ethanol fuel, and it will cause corrosion. I decided to replace the filler neck hose and the vent tube hose with some ethanol rated hose instead. You might need to cut these things off. Always cut away from yourself. You're going to need a tight 90 degree bend on both of these hoses. Grab the old hose and put it along the new one and mark it for length. The coping saw works pretty good for this. Clean off the excess rubber bits that come off when sawing. On the top hose, the shorter end goes towards the filler neck and on the bottom hose, the longer end does. And I might as well replace these hose clamps too with some stainless ones. Most bigger hose clamps use eight millimeter sockets. Make sure the top hose clamp will not rub the bottom hose. Next is replacing the fuel pump with an E85 compatible higher flow fuel pump. I usually take a hammer and a screwdriver and hammer back on these tabs in order to open up the tank. You're only supposed to use a brass punch on this to prevent sparks, but guess who doesn't have one? This locking ring will rotate until it's free. Then pull the fuel pump apparatus out. Be careful not to bend or break the fuel level float arm. It's pretty hard to maneuver it out. Just work at it slowly. Now go ahead and drain the gas tank. There's not really an easy way to do this. It's got to go out the top because the two inlets on the front actually extend past the wall of the tank. You can let it dry out for a little while. I'm going to use a 340 liter per hour fuel pump for my application. It might be a little bit low for a V8, but I think it's going to cover me for the V6. Stock Fieros have this vibration damper in place of this hose here. These things wear out and you can just replace it with a piece of hose if you want. Go ahead and remove the fuel pump from the system. Make sure not to obstruct either of these holes. I got this in by first installing the sock and the rubber damper and then putting the fuel pump in. I backed off the hose on the top in order to squeeze it over and then slid it back over the fuel pump port. I ended up not using the locking ring because it was nearly impossible to get it on. I don't think this thing's going anywhere though. I'm going to double up on these hose clamps just because it's a pain in the neck to get back in here again. I'm going to use the leftover excess quarter inch hose that came with the fuel pump on my quarter inch return line here and a quarter inch to dash six male barb. Now we're going to rewire the fuel pump circuit in the car so that it can take a little higher current to support this fuel pump. One problem with this fuel sending unit from the Fiero store is that this fuel pump calls for 12 gauge wire. The Fiero store's wire is 16 or higher. And this E85 340 liter per hour pump could actually pull up to 16 amps under the right pressure conditions. Also, the connector to the fuel pump is different. So I'm going to have to change this connector or the wiring in some way anyways. AEM recommends 12 gauge wire, but then they ship it with like 16 or 18 gauge wire. So we're gonna replace this too. You really want as least connections as possible. So try to avoid all butt connectors and wire and crimp pins instead. The setup that I've made here does add an extra connector in the middle, but I believe it's probably the easiest, unless you want to get like a custom bulkhead connector. I'll link that in the description. Tronics makes a custom bulkhead connector that has four pins going into the gas tank instead of this three on this original GM. I'm going to utilize this extra pin in order to double feed two different wires to my fuel pump for both the power and the ground wires. That way, this fuel pump circuit should be able to support up to 28 amps instead of the 14 amps that this old bulkhead connector supports. Check out the link to the forum post in the description of all the lengths, pins, wires, and connectors. First, we're gonna work on the wiring on the inside of the gas tank. Sure, anything on the inside of the tank is traded for gasoline and oil resistance. I don't need this old fuel pump connector at all anymore. These pins to this fuel connector are for 10 to 12 gauge. I'm actually going to squeeze two 14 gauge wires in here instead. It's a pretty tight fit and I'm using size A on the crimpers to crimp the insulation. A is a little bit undersized. Don't crimp it too tight or else you might shear these tabs off. Move to size B on the crimpers and then crimp the tabs on the wire itself now. We want to make sure that we get the polarity right so that the red is in the right spot. Just look at the factory connector and copy the orientation of the pins. 
you should hear a little bit of a click when the pin retaining clip snaps into place. For the ground side, we're gonna do something a little bit different. The Fiero store already has a internal ground wire inside the fuel tank grounding to the sender unit itself. It actually had two of them. There was a splice that went from the pump to this ground and then from the ground to the connector. And I'm going to make this connection at the fuel pump instead of at this joint here. So I'm going to cut one of these wires off. The crimp on here is no good. The insulation actually is not crimped. Then I'm going to cut the pin off on the other side of the wire, put one 12 gauge wire in here, and then this 16 or 18 gauge wire, double crimp it. Now let's plug this new connector into the pump and see what lengths we need to get to the bulkhead connector on the top. Always leave a little bit of excess just in case we mess this up. You could reuse this four pin connector and just put an extra pin in there. I'm going to take the pins out on these connectors, pull out the tab on the back, and then stick a hairpin into the slot on the front of the connector. Same routine here by just stripping these to length and then crimping the new pins on that go to this bulkhead connector. These smaller pins, I'm using the D crimp for the wire and the C crimp for the insulation. Let's get this three pin bulkhead connector removed. I'm going to have to pry up on some of these tabs in order to release it. Now put the new four pin Racetronics bulkhead connector on. It's a press fit with the bottom bracket. In order to press this latch on here, I'm using an 11 millimeter socket and I'm putting a little key behind the connector on my vise. Press the socket on. There should not be any play in the bulkhead at all when you're done. Now I'm going to pin out the connector on the bulkhead to see where the pins go so that I know how to pin this connector. It looks like the two middle pins on the outside of the tank go to the front two pins on the inside of the tank here. Now we're going to focus on the part of the harness outside of the tank that's going to plug into the car side. Now for the connector on the outside of the bulkhead. Here I'm going to lay out the old wiring harness and see what lengths I need. I'm going to cut two 14 gauge red wires to length of this old harness. I decided to replace this purple fuel gauge level wire with a green wire instead. And then I'm going to cut a 12 gauge black ground wire to length. Start by first popping the weather seal out. You have to thread the wires through this connector first. It's called a pole to seat connector. It might be advantageous to not strip the wire first so that you can have an easier time threading the wires through this connector. These pins are a little bit smaller. They only take up to 14 gauge wire. Here I'm using the E crimper to crimp the wire and the D crimper to crimp the insulation and then pull it backwards. These pins are keyed, so they'll only go in one way into the connector. You should hear a slight click when you pull it backwards and it seats properly. It is seated if you cannot push it back out from the rear. Onto the other side of the harness, this one the socket pins go into. I use size A to crimp to this weather seal here. Don't go all the way down though, this crimper isn't really made for this. It should look like a round crimp. Then I used crimp C for the wire crimps. It might be a good idea to solder them before you crimp the insulation on. I like to use flux pins when I do this and then go ahead and start heating it up to solder it on. The soldering iron should get the wire hot enough that the solder melts into the wire and not the iron. Heat gun might help speed up the process but just don't hold it too close to singe the insulation. Then go ahead and insert this pin into the connector. Unfortunately, my Fiero store fuel sender does not have a ground terminal welded on the exterior of the fuel sending unit. So if I'm going to do two 14 gauge wires going in, I should have something equal or greater coming out, going to ground. I'm just going to take a hose clamp and tighten it down on my vent line here. Stick this spade terminal connector underneath the hose clamp. I'm going to apply a little bit of blue Loctite to this hose clamp because I do not want this thing loosening up. And as you see here, you can bend this tab back a little bit and plug in the new spade terminal to it. Here I heat up and pull off this yellow insulation because I don't really need it. Next, if you want to be extra careful, go ahead and solder these. Then I'm going to wrap the lumen electrical tape. Then I went ahead and zip tied this thing up. Before you button it up, it might be worthwhile to test the fuel pump. You don't want to run it for more than a brief second, but to see if it'll spin, go ahead and hook the ground up to minus on a power supply and the power up to a 14 volt supply. Then we're gonna focus on the harness that will go on the car side. I've got a new mating connector for the same connector that we just finished on the other side. I'm gonna pin this connector with my two 14 gauge positive wires that will go straight to the fuel pump relay. Now I'm going to move on to the ground pins. I'm actually going to use a 12 gauge wire here. 12 gauge wire actually requires a different size weather seal. I'm going to double up on this ring terminal here and connect both my primary and my second ground to the same ring terminal. I have a 14 gauge and a 12 gauge wire here and they seem to fit pretty good in this yellow terminal. Generally, it's best practice to keep the grounds as far away from the positives in case there's any strands of wire sticking out. So here's the final result. I've got double 14 gauge wires going into the power and the ground on a 10 gauge connector to the fuel pump. I ran out of black wire, so I used this red wire to ground the chassis. I retained this purple wire from the factory to the fuel tank level sensor, and I have 
my two 14 gauge power wires going to the vapor side bulkhead connector on this side of the tank, along with the 14 gauge ground wire and the smaller fuel level gauge. And I've got the bulkhead connector from Racetronics. And I've got my IAC connector, all pinned with, again, 14 gauge wire. And then that goes to this new four pin weather pack connector. All, again, all pinned with 14 gauge wire on this side too. Since these weather pack connectors can actually fit larger wire, I use some 12 gauge for my ground wire. And then these two are my power wires going to go to the relay. And then this is going to be my fuel center gauge that I'm going to have to splice while it's installed on the car. And on the end of the weather pack connector, I'm going to put this relay pin with two 14 gauge wires. But since this is a pull to seat connector, like before, I'm going to have to pull these wires through the relay first and then pull it into place. Partway through this, I realized that I should probably just go with the six pin connector instead, instead of having this extra ground connection going outside of the connector. So I deep pinned the four pin connector and I ordered a six pin connector. Now on the car side, I'm actually going to deep pin this old three pin connector and reuse some of the pins. First, you must pop off the block on the back of the connector and then you can release the pin. Here I cut down an old radio antenna that's the same exact diameter as the tool needed to release this pin. It works like a charm. But I am going to reuse this fuel tank level wire which is the reddish wire coming out of the middle of this connector here. Thankfully these are the same exact connectors just one has an extra pin so we'll just stick it right in and it'll click right into place. Zip tie the new connector approximately where it's going to be where you're going to plug this old fuel sender pin in. Here I decided to use a spark plug wire clamp to stick in a hole in the frame to retain this cable. Then go ahead and run the cables where you see fit. Make sure to keep them away from the exhaust or the belt. I wrap this ground around the battery and tie it to a ground wire that's going directly to the battery negative. And if you haven't already, make sure you swap out your fuse to the relay with a 15 amp fuse. My James Brown harness already came with a 15 amp fuse anyways. Now for the two positive wires to the relay. I decided to run my cables through the fuel tank compartment to stay away from the headers. I was able to use a snake grabber tool to do this. I'm going to remove this fuel pump relay and repin the connector with a bigger gauge wire. The fuel pump relay in my car is the one with the big orange wire and the 14 gauge tan wire coming out of it. First open up the relay by pressing down on the tab and then pulling it out. You might have to use a screwdriver to get it out. You are able to pull the tops of these relays off, but it should look like this instead. These things are pull to seat, so you must take the relay off, press down on a tab, and then push the pin out through the top. You'll have to press down on the tab with a small screwdriver of some sort. Now I can pull this thing all the rest of the way out and cut off the connector and pull this old small wire out. I don't need this tan wire anymore that used to supply power from the relay as I'm increasing the gauge and wiring it directly. Cut and trim the wires appropriately. Now thread your two 14 gauge red wires through this hole. It might be a little bit of a tight fit through the silicone backing. Then strip the two wires and put them into this 10 gauge relay pin. I decided to borrow some professional crimpers for this job. You could probably get away with the cheap ones in the description instead of a $300 pair of these. For extra security, I decided to solder these two wires to this connector. Then since the wires already pulled through the connector, we have to pull it back in order to seat the pin and you should hear a nice click. Then just reassemble the relay. Now it's time to put the fuel pump assembly in the tank. Lightly lubricate the seal with some soapy water so that it doesn't get caught when we're sealing it in. I always have the worst luck with these seals. They always seem to shrink a little bit and they'll never seal up again. So you should always replace these with new ones. Before you start, make sure you have the locking ring in the correct location because you will not be able to fit it over. I did have an initial problem with this Fiero store reproduction. The fuel level float actually interfered with the side of the baffling inside the tank. So make sure to double check yours and make sure that your arm can move freely. Go ahead and hammer the locking ring back in place, again preferably with a brass punch so that it does not spark. Before hammering this thing shut all the way, go ahead and test the seal. Put your mouth on the filler neck tube, cover the vent hose, and see if you can pressurize the tank by blowing into it. If you don't hear any air escaping, then the seal sat properly. I'll replace the gas tank. I like to slide it in towards the front and then hinge it from the slot that it slides into. Then just raise the rear, attach a strap, and thread the 13 millimeter nut back on. Then make all of your connections at the rear of the tank. After this point, be sure to not be priming the pump with no gasoline in the tank. Now, before we get too far, we need to make sure that we adjust the tune before filling up the tank with ethanol gas. In a future video, I will explain how exactly to set up HP tuners and do a mass airflow calibration tune. But for just for this video, this will get you on the road. Depending on the year, make, and model of your car, some of your options may look slightly different than mine. Once you have HP tuners licensed and you have downloaded your computer's calibration from it, open up VCM editor with your calibration file. 
go to the engine section. Click on the fuel tab. Do not touch the 14.7 stoichiometry stoic AFR because for some reason on these ECUs that does not affect all of the tables required and go down to the button that says cylinder gain gain versus cylinder click on that and we're going to adjust the cylinder injector skew for each fuel injector this is the best way of doing this on this car injector skew will increase your fuel rate by a constant factor for all of your injectors and it'll apply to every table that your engine uses to determine proper air to fuel ratio I made a spreadsheet document that I will link in this description that generates these numbers based on what percent ethanol content that you can find at the gas station. I would recommend always sticking with the skew factor of E85, which would be about 1.32. Reason for this is if you run a lower mixture of ethanol to gasoline ratio later on, then it will not be lean. Lean will typically end up in engine damage if you're not careful. So just type in 1.32 into all these boxes. If you did change fuel injectors, you may want to update the injector flow rate table. You should be able to find specifications for your manufacturer's injectors. I included some for common ones in the Excel sheet from before. Then we're going to hit save and press the right vehicle button and you're going to only write calibration. Now grab this ethanol content test kit and go to your nearest gas station that sells E85. If you notice here on this pump, it could be from mid 50s to the mid 80% ethanol. So we wanna know how much ethanol content is actually in this gasoline. In this test kit, all you've gotta do is fill up this bottle to the bottom line with the water, and then fill it up to the top line with the gasoline or E85. Shake it up a little bit and it should separate in a, about a minute or two. And wherever that line is that it separates is your ethanol content. Mine sh here shows about 70%. Keep that number in mind for later when we're doing some programming. Now fill up your gas can or shop around a little bit at other gas stations to see if you can find some higher ethanol content gas. And bring it home and fill up the car. Three or four gallons should do. All we've really got to do is be able to prime the pump and make it over to a gas station. Try to fill up your car in a ventilated area. Do not have anything that will create a spark around you. Check under the car for any fuel leaks from filling it up. Then tighten up that one fitting that you forgot about. Then turn your ignition on, but not, do not start the car. Cycle it on and off several times. It might be a good idea to test the fuel sender first and make sure it's still working. Also take this time and check every single connection on your tank and check if there's any spots of gas on the ground. Your pump has been pumping and priming the lines and if there's any leaks, they'll probably show up now. Then reinstall the tire, lower the car to the ground and torque the lug nuts in a star pattern to 100 foot pounds. Congratulations, your car is now E85 compatible. Go ahead and start it up and let it just idle for a couple of minutes to get the engine calibration dialed in. This gauge only reads in either lambda or gasoline equivalent AFR. Basically, if you leave this gauge in the gas equivalent mode, you want this fuel range to be 14.7 nominally and as low as 11.5 under power and as high as 16.5 under cruise. Going above 16.5 could result in blowing up your engine. When you take it to a gas station, make sure to check that the seal on top of the tank is sealed all the way. If gas comes out of the top of the tank and is all over the ground, then you've got that leak somewhere. If you plan on parking the car for a long period of time, then you're going to want to do something called pickling the tank. It would be advisable to switch back to regular gasoline with no ethanol in it because ethanol will actually absorb water out of the atmosphere. It will actually rust the tank from the inside out. Before you fill the tank up, you might want to pour in some fuel stabilizer. Get the red stay Bill product and follow the instructions. Switch your fuel injector skew back to one after you go to the gas station. Then you're going to want to store your tank full. You can do this with ethanol, but it's safer to do it with just gas. You're still going to have a little bit of ethanol in the tank when you switch back over to gas, but that is okay because it's full, so air cannot get in for the gas to absorb moisture out of the atmosphere. You really do need to tune this engine in order to be able to utilize this power. Check in later for a proper tuning video on how to utilize this O2 sensor gauge to get the most out of our E85 setup. Perform a math calibration tune in the next video.